2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 22-26 through 26 in the Christian Standard Bible. Flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But reject foolish and ignorant disputes, because you know that they breed quarrels. The Lord's servant must not quarrel, but must be gentle to everyone, able to teach, and patient, instructing his opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth. Then they may come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil, who has taken them captive to do his will. In this section of scripture, um, the writers just finished explaining the importance of avoiding fights about words, um, to prioritize instead the message that Jesus has died for our sins and rose again. After condemning a group of people for preaching a false, false gospel about the resurrection, the author writes the above scripture. Um, so in context of all this, uh, Dr. Thomas Ord, how does this section of scripture teach us to disagree better? In your opinion well the word that jumps out for me when you read it is the word gentleness I assume we're going to have disagreements probably even disagreements about what it means to say Jesus died for our sins and rose again I know lots of mm -hmm. Christians yeah. who disagree <laughs> on even what we consider essential so yeah. what jumped out to me was in the midst of those disagreements we ought to do so at least to the best of our ability in a gentle way uh, which I assume means respecting the views of others, uh, not going over the top and extreme uh, criticisms. Disagreeing involves criticism, but not sort of uh, attacking the person or trying to inflame the conversation in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Criticizing the view and not the person? That's important, I think. Hey everybody, welcome to The Whole Church Podcast, possibly your favorite series. If so, sorry, we're getting near the end. This is the last full episode of our controversial Unity episode. And we're like, yo, who would be best to end this, this controversy series that we're doing? And we're like, you know what? Who was the most uh, provocative person we've had on the show yet? And we're like, you know what? Remember that time that, to that uh, Dr. Ord came on and said, God can't? And remember that time that Dr. <laughs> Ord came on and said that... Uh, that uh, actually we should be affirming of the LGBT community. And you remember that time that Dr. Ward came on <laughs> and said he can't, God can't know all things. We figured, you know what? We, ha we haven't heard his take on spiritual gifts yet. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, me and my co-host both grew up Pentecostal. So we grew up really close to some of the ideas around spiritual gifts and whether they continued or not. Obviously grew we grew up with it, they, they continued. Um, and one spiritual gift that we all know, we all have the ability through Christ to perceive the voice of the one and only greatest co-host of all time, DJ Tiberius One Blackwell. Welcome to your show. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, nice little yeah. sprinkle of, of blasphemy to get in. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I always like to start with just a little bit of blasphemy. And <laughs> uh, Dr. Ord, thank you again for joining us. Um, and, and for those listening, as always... I have no idea what he's going to say this time. I, I don't know his view on this, so it's going to be fun. Yeah. Uh, check us out on the Honest Out Ministries podcast network website. The link is below. You can check out other shows like ours that we partner with. And if you're already listening on the AMP Network YouTube channel, uh, hit like and subscribe or else. Why or else? You keep saying or else. What is the or else? Hopefully we'll never have to know. All right. Whatever it is, he's going to do it gently, as Scripture says. Yes. Scripture Without quarreling, <laughs> you'll be dealt with. Respectfully. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, well, and with that in mind, um, you know, we, we try not to get too serious on this show. So <laughs> I like to start with my favorite uh, form of Christian unity, uh, a great spiritual practice of silliness. And uh, Dr. Ward, today, uh, TJ and I, we started the series. We already answered this question. So this is just to you. What is the silliest argument that you remember having? Please Silly. One of the ones I've had. With you. Well, silliest. That's tough. The first one that comes to mind is actually an argument with my wife over who ate the last ice cream bar out of our freezer. That sounds pretty silly. I don't know if it's the hmm. silliest. Wait, who, but... who was it? Was I, I think it was her. I she thought it was me. And um, yeah, so I don't know. 
I don't think that argument ever concluded, except we'd have to agree to disagree. But that's the first one that jumps to my mind. Well, listeners, if you're wondering, if I'm ever at your home and you're out of ice cream bars, it was me. (laughs) I can confirm. I can confirm now once and for all. Yeah. Yeah, there's a reason we don't buy them. (laughs) They don't last long. No. No, they do not. I, I eat them two at a time, actually. It's true. Yeah, it's we don't live in the actually. same place. It just the same rule just happens to apply at TJ's place of residence. Yeah. So with that in mind, uh, we're going to move on, and we are trying to get ahead of ourselves a little bit, and you know, starting with the punchline and then going back to kind of flesh it out. Doctor Ord, um, could you explain some of the different views when it comes to the terms that usually used are cessationism or continuationism, I probably pronounced those wrong. Um, there Maybe there are some other views. Could you just kind of explain what are the different stances when it comes to the continuation of the gifts of the Spirit, what we're talking about, and maybe kind of hint us in about where you lie on the, on the issue. Yeah, well, the gifts of the Spirit uh, are listed in various places in Scripture and have different lists. So if you ever come compare them, you'll notice that um, they don't always match together, and that leads people to have different... Uh, things that they think qualify as the gifts of the Spirit. But uh, the question that you're asking is more about whether or not the gifts of the Spirit are still active today. And those who are cessationists, as you mentioned, think that uh, whatever we find in Scripture related to the gifts of Spirit, and here they usually have more demonstrable or extravagant gifts like speaking in tongues, prophecy, uh, maybe uh, words of knowledge, certain healings. Those people think they really happened in the past, but they don't. They no longer happen today, um, and I think they they make this claim less on biblical grounds and more on just the fact that they don't seem to see these things happening as at least to the same rate. Now, you two guys grew up in the Pentecostal tradition, so um, you probably have experiences yeah. in which people <laughs> claim to have these things, but. Um, the average Joe on the street who goes to First Presbyterian downtown has doesn't hasn't witnessed the kinds of things that you can witness in a Pentecostal service. As for my own view, I think of spiritual gifts as including many activities and things far beyond what are listed in Scripture. But uh, the big and controversial ones are some of the ones I've just mentioned, like speaking in tongues. Uh, I not only have spoken tongues, but grew up in a church in which that was a common practice. Uh, I no longer speak in tongues. I don't have any problem with people speaking in tongues, so long as they don't try to pawn it off as what the most spiritual people do is speaking in tongues, like it's some kind of a higher calling or higher vision. Um, I think speaking in tongues generally today, or the Greek word is glossolalia, more commonly called prayer language in the churches I've been a part of. Uh, It's typically meant for the edification of the one doing it, not for the the whole body. So oftentimes there's no interpretation. In fact, oftentimes it's not even thought of as to be an actual language, but it's just a way of letting your tongue go and believing that the Holy Spirit is guiding that. I got no problem with that. Um, Just again, so long as people don't become elitist about it. So there's my opening yeah. statement. <laughs> yeah. without, without chasing the rabbit too much. Um, okay. I like the idea of talking about other things other than just speaking in tongues and prophecy. Um, specifically Forgotten God by Francis Chan is a book I actually really like on this because at the end of like, so he'll have a chapter where he kind of going through like his beliefs and like working through stuff. And then he'll have an example of someone who has a spiritual gift. And a lot of those spiritual gifts are just, you know, kindness treating people with a level of joy or love that doesn't make sense in our human capacity. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. It's nice. Um, and then uh, the first Corinthians 12 through 14 should be written, should be read together. You should not read first Corinthians 13 alone, in my opinion. I mean, you can, but I think it's out of context when you do that. And I think there's a point when in first Corinthians 14, Paul talks about those who just speak in tongues and treat it as a better gift, like you're talking about and says that they're childish. And he says there is a better gift than all of that, um, than prophecy or than speaking in tongues. And I believe he's talking about that kind of love he was talking about in 1 Corinthians 13. Whether it was the same author or not, that's up for debate. 
seems like 13 was kind of written separately and you know that gets into like those weird things and i'm like i think it was edited together but however it got there it was placed there intentionally so yeah i, I actually think, think of speaking in tongues at least in the way it's normally done today not in the sense of like interpretation and thinking that's a word for the public but today 98 percent of the speaking tongues i've done or been aware of is for the individual and they usually do it mm -hmm. quietly or under their breath in the midst of prayer or singing and it it gives them a sense of inspiration empowerment closeness uh to god and i got no problem with that at all since you mm -hmm. have me on here to be controversial let me make an <laughs> analogy I think most prayer language is like masturbation is really good for the individual doing it, but it's not really good for the rest of the community. Now I got no problems with masturbation, yep. thumbs up on masturbation. But if you're going to have a community that really gets things done in the world, you've got to think about what you're going to do in, co in connection with other people. Um, and so, you know, uh, masturbation has its place, just like speaking in tongues has its place, but I don't put it at the top of as the most important thing. Right. Yeah. yeah I just. I will I say. Think, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. Growing up as a Pentecostal, uh, we were kind of taught like you know you are sanctified when you have spoken in tongues. Usually, you know, mm -hmm. put other gifts in there sometimes, but usually they're just like, yeah, when you speak in tongues, you're good. That's how you know. Yep. Yeah, and I. I will agree with uh, Dr. Ord. You know, I'm a continuationist. I think the spirit gets the spirit continue, even speaking in tongues. Um, I disagree with a lot of Pentecostal denominations, including the one I used to be a part of, that TJ's still a part of, with the idea that uh, speaking in tongues is the evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit. I don't think that's biblically based. I don't think that's experientially founded. You know, I I don't see a real foundation for that belief anywhere. So, yeah. Um, would you also, also w w would you guys rank these? Like for me, speaking in tongues is kind of pretty far down on my list of most important. Hosting podcasts, that's above speaking in tongues in my view. Yeah. Oh, as far as spiritual gifts? I'm, yeah, I'm not even joking. Yeah, yeah. I really believe hosting podcasts is more important for the kingdom of God than speaking in tongues. But do you guys like have a kind of a, at least an so, implicit list in your minds? I think it really depends on uh, – your individual context uh, for a lot of people speaking in tongues could be much more beneficial. People who are put in situations where they aren't somewhere where they speak the language and are truly blessed with the gift of tongues, I believe can still happen. Uh, in those cases, it wouldn't be very helpful for them to host a podcast uh, because they're in an environment where no one's going to listen to it or understand uh, it because it's not yeah. in their language. Uh, yeah. Good point. Yeah. Broad strokes though. Probably running a ministry mm -hmm. tends to be more useful than speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's, there's different kinds. I'm going to have to show my crazy Pentecostal side on this episode. I'm sorry, everybody. There's different, like when we say speaking in tongues, I think we mean different things sometimes. Um, and I have, and still do sometimes speak in tongues in the manner of like that heavenly language idea where it's just kind of a intimate personal thing. I do want to say, I do this. I don't know if I agree with Dr. Ward when it comes to masturbation. Uh, my view is really nuanced. I don't think it's always a good thing. I don't think it's always a bad thing. But I definitely think speaking in tongues is, is a more personal thing most of the time. But I've also had an experience where I was praying and I began speaking in tongues. And the person next to me started talking to me. And then later, someone else said that apparently I was speaking Italian. I was like, okay, interesting. Um, again, you know... Without actually knowing what I said, I don't know how much merit to put into that. But if it did work out the way that they said, that's awesome. That sounds pretty useful. But even in that context, you know, maybe, possibly, I'm not sure, I talked to one person. Um, podcasting, you know, without giving our numbers, we, we talked to thousands of people. So it feels weightier. I don't know if I would put it on a scale or not, but it does feel weightier. Well, you started off your your thing by talking about masturbation again, and you made it sound like um, that you think speaking in tongues. Well, well, you sound you made the claim masturbation may be good in some contexts and not in others, and then you went on to talk about speaking in tongues, and I got the impression that you were saying it's always a good thing, 
But I'll bet you don't think that. In fact, Scripture says no. it's not always a good thing. <laughs> um, so I think the analogy can still hold there. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and that goes back to First Corinthians 14, I think, where, where Paul was talking about like how people were going to this church who kept saying speaking in tongues was the best gift. So everybody's speaking in tongues and people go to the church and they're like confused, intimidated. They don't want anything to do with the church or with God. And then they're missing out on uh, that uh, omnipotence. Uh, that <laughs> we talked right. about before. Yeah. You know, I actually preached a sermon on that passage when I was doing my doctoral work. It was on a Sunday night. I got up in front of the people, and for 10 minutes, I did a sermon in which I just laced it full of technical philosophical language. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> the people in the congregation were like going to sleep, like, what is this? And then I stopped and I walked down to the congregation. And I said, I want to talk to you about this passage about speaking in tongues and how people don't understand it and why it wasn't profitable or helpful. Anyway, mm-hmm. so yeah. yeah, I know that passage. Another one, and then we're gonna we're gonna move on. I actually think when we're talking about like ranking them, which again, this feels blasphemous, but I feel like it's good. I like this actually. <laughs> I actually put the the spiritual gift of knowledge above everything else. And that's not just someone who is knowledgeable. For me, whenever I was reading Francis Jane's book, and I was really wrestling with this idea, I remembered my grandfather, my dad's dad, they used to tell all these stories where he would work on people's cars and everyone would bring their car to him. And he wasn't like, he didn't go to school for it or anything. He would, if he had an issue, he's prayed about it, he'd go to sleep. And a lot of times he'd wake up and he just kind of knew what to do. And he would just go and fix these people's cars. And that was like, he was never a pastor, but that was a ministry that I think was really valuable. And if I had to put that ranking, you know, how valuable that was, how he helped his community and those around him to someone who learned how to speak. And again, I'm not trying to be mean, like clanging symbols. I'll use that phrase. (laughs) You know, I think that's probably a little bit more useful. That's pretty crazy. The spiritual gift of being a good mechanic. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have, mechanics. we have biblical precedent for saying yeah. that some gifts are better than others. You know, the Apostle Paul says we ought to seek the greater gifts. In fact, um, he then launches into love being the highest of them. Oh, yeah. um, but this brings up an issue you included earlier in your list, the gift of kindness. Ooh, and it yeah. got me to thinking about how some people will say, uh, you know, you have this gift, the gift of teaching. You have this gift, the gift of singing. You have this gift, the gift of tongues. You have this gift. And then they'll say, uh, well, don't expect me to sing because I don't have the gift of singing. <laughs> and then that, and I understand yeah. what they mean. Like, I'm not that great of a singer myself. Yeah, I sound, I sound But garbage. like, do we say that about kindness? Look, I don't have the gift of kindness, so I'm just going to be rude. Or I don't have the gift of gentleness, so I'm just going to be a jerk. You know? <laughs> uh, that uh, seems to me kind of weird. Yeah. Oh, and that's like, that goes back to the knowledge thing, too. Like, I feel like I have a lot of knowledge, and I would never say I had the spiritual gift of knowledge. And I might even think that I'm smarter than my grandfather a lot of times. You know, maybe that's arrogant, but I'm just, you know, thinking like I had more education than him and stuff. Yeah. But I would consider that he had that spiritual gift. So, you know, and, and I know people in my life, they are, I try to be kind, but are, are, are kind to a point that I'm like, it, it's almost godly. And at that point, I'm like, that seems like a spiritual gift. Maybe that's different than just the kindness we all ought to have. And mm-hmm. I think that gets into like the difference of fruit and work and gifts. And uh, I'm not sure yeah. if that's a, uh, that might be above my pay grade. Maybe I'm not smart enough to yeah. dissect I know, all that. But I feel like I know I, I definitely don't have the gift of chair stacking. Or chair moving. <laughs> no. I love I love the churches that are like, you have the gift of servitude. Come over here. We got some stuff for you to do. <laughs> yeah, big fan. But well, we're oh. getting pretty into this. Um, and we're skipping the thing we're supposed to do before we do that. So, my bad. Oh, sorry. Uh, we, we would like to take a quick controversial detour as we are putting every guest in front of what we call the hot seat. We are going to run through as many of the following questions as we can in five minutes. Some of them are theological. Some of them are pop culture. And I'm just going to pick them randomly. I'm going to try to find your hottest take or most controversial opinion. And I'm nearly positive they're not actually going to be in this list of questions. I can't fathom what your hottest take would be, but I know it's hot. It might just be that God can't. <laughs> that God might be can't. it. I already found it. <laughs> yeah. Yo, before I finished reading your book, my roommate borrowed it. And then he took it to New Mexico with him. To play football for a season. 
All right. Tell me your address. I'll send you a copy. What is it? Nah, he'll be back soon. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, rank the Spider-Men. Tell me McGuire, Andrew Garfield, and Tom Holland from best to worst. All right. Here's my hot take. I don't give a rip. That is the hottest take available. Thank you. Uh, is Jesus more important than the Bible? Yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, who is your least favorite church father or theologian? Augustine sucks. Real. Let me give you, you a little. Let me give you a little poem. You can pronounce it Augustine, or you can say Augustine, but either way you say it, his theology's disgusting. I love poetry. That, that is a pretty that is a pretty hot take. <laughs> so what what is the best music? Bit of an open question. Ooh. The best music? You know, if I have a choice, I will listen to funk. I like I like to crank up the funk when I'm exercising. Fantastic you ever listen to uh, you ever listen to modern funk? Uh, a little bit, but I don't know it as well, so I I don't listen to mm. it as often. Yeah, I like uh, I like pigeons playing ping pong a lot. You should check them out. Okay, I don't even know them. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. So, how important is truth to you? Very. Uh, I is, don't know how to rank it, but it's pretty high. Well, is it more important than love? No. All right. Uh, do you have a least favorite Bible verse? Least favorite? Who? I got a lot of my bad Bible verses either because I think they have bad theology or they've just been used wrongly. Um, the one I like the least. Well, I'll just pick a violent one. Uh, the Psalms that talks about bashing babies' heads against the rocks as if God wanted that. Mm. That's, Normal, that's yeah. I, I hate that yeah. one. Yeah, that's made it twice on the list. Has it? Yeah. It's, a, it's a good one to hate, apparently. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> that's a, if you're going to have a least yeah. favorite, that's probably a good one to pick. Uh, what's one hot take you might have about a cartoon that we may have grown up with and we are all different ages. So, you know, mm. yeah, you're asking the wrong guy. Cause I grew up in a house that didn't have a television. So like I rarely watched cartoons. I'd have to go to somebody else's house to watch cartoons. Yeah, I can relate. We had, we had some cartoons, but then it kind of, you know, yeah, I cannot relate. I live modern times next door to Disney basically. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what is one yeah. movie, book, or song that you love that no one else does? Yep, I got one for you here. Breaking the Waves. It was nominated for Best Picture about 20 years ago. It's a really hard story about a woman who's kind of got mental problems. It's a lot about sex and God. You guys got to watch it, but you probably hate it. I, I can't oh. wait to watch that now, actually. So... So what's one that everyone loves that you don't care for? Well, I'm not a fan of the um, Marvel series. I, I don't, you know, you asked me about Spider-Man. Like, I don't go to any of those movies. Um, they just don't do it for me. I don't know what it is. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> what is one theological doctrine that you have changed your mind about? Oh, my goodness. One. It'd be easier for me to go pick one that I haven't changed. I mean, yeah. Yeah. There are fewer of those. I've changed my mind on so many things. Yeah, uh, maybe the wrong person for this question, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah just, just pick the, the craziest one. Or the, the most inconsequential one. That That's what I'm curious of. What's the most inconsequential change you've made? You know... I don't know if this is controversial or not, but I'm not really, I pretty much doubt there's a Satan or a devil, hmm. but I'm fine with demons. I think it's more likely that there are demons than that there are, there is a devil, at least the way the devil is usually defined. Right. So like the Goetic demons or real what Abrahamic? Demons? All right. Never mind. <laughs> uh, so I don't know the distinction. Sorry. Good. That, that's a good <laughs> thing. They're like the crazy people demons. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So, do you like the movie Titanic? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. not like my top list, but I, I like it generally. Yeah, it's a fun movie. Josh no. hates it. So, yeah. Oh, really? That's the whole reason this question's here. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see how other people felt about it. Yeah, this, this whole section is because Josh has really bad opinions. 
That's not. That's just not true. Two of list. the questions are because I have really bad opinions. I have a list of his bad opinions. So, <laughs> what is one thing that you thought you would never like that you later have come to enjoy? Vegetables. Hmm. I did grew up not eating vegetables, and now I eat lots of vegetables. Yeah. Once you learn how to cook them yourself, it gets way easier. Yeah, and also, you know, you, know, you start looking about your weight and your health and all that sort of stuff. And yeah. Yeah, I think cabbage steaks was a game changer for me. I hate to to prolong the segment, but, you know, I grew up, my dad made this like pot roast, and he had carrots and potatoes, and I always told myself when I was growing up, I was going to make this without the stupid carrots. I don't want carrots. I did that a couple times. Now my pot roast is pretty much all carrots. (laughs) I realized that was actually the good part. I just didn't know. You know, that's funny because my parents made pot roast with carrots and potatoes too. That's, That's wild. Hmm. But I haven't Where'd done. I still like pot roast, but I haven't put pa- potatoes and carrots, and partly because our our pot isn't big enough to put too much uh, more in it. But yeah, I'll carrots really the, game changer. Yeah, I put celery in. Why don't you too. stop hating them just because they're vegetables? <laughs> you put celery in yours next time. Ooh. Oh yeah, it's good. Hmm. Cut it All small, right. not tiny, but interesting. Also, yeah. uh, for those wondering, you can watch Breaking the Waves on Max. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I it might is be a doing great that later movie. today. I mean, it's a movie that's going to make you think. I used to show it to my college students, and they were like, they were numb after they watched it. And Damn not me. because of the sex, but the sex is really important to the movie. Um, but the I mean, God stuff is pretty wild. Yeah, I can't wait to watch this. Well, that is all we have for the hot seat. Thanks for playing. Mm. Mm. Good times. Good times. Anyway, so, um, yeah, actually, we've already addressed some of my other questions. TJ, well, to your next question. So, <laughs> how sure are you of your views around the continuation of the gifts of the spirit? Look, I'm not sure of my views on practically everything. So, let's just start with that. That when it comes to surety and confidence and certainty, I don't have any certainty. I got varying levels of confidence. Hmm. Certain things um, boring. I don't really think, you know, when I was younger, I thought a lot more about the gifts of spirit, of the spirit. And that was par- probably because I was in a church in which that was an important topic. And, you know, and because of the speaking in tongues and words of knowledge and healing and all that sort of stuff. But then I went through a phase in which I thought all that stuff was crap and I walked away from it all. And, and then my coming back to belief in God and believe that the Holy Spirit is active in my life and in the world, I didn't go back and work very hard at trying to um, recapture all that stuff because it had a lot of negative baggage related to it. And I found I could make just as a better sense of my life without appealing to that. So long as I believed that there was the Holy Spirit was active in all of the world in my life that the Holy Spirit inspired and empowered everything that was good, whether it was Mm -hmm. listed as a gift of the Spirit or not, um, and everything that was negative was to be blamed upon creatures or creation not cooperating with the Spirit, I didn't have to bring back the the, the gifts of the Spirit in the the way I had been taught when I was younger. So Mm -hmm. I I don't think about it like I used to. So. We talked about like how we all kind of believe in a continuation, and then we're talking about like ranking them. What is <laughs> this? This is a weird question, but what what are the weirdest ones you still think are a thing? Like, do you still think like there's a spiritual gift of healing, of prophecy? Like, what are the weirdest ones you still hold on to? So I definitely believe in healing. I just don't believe that God alone heals. I do think, however, that some people in the way they act, they can. Um, raise the level of expectation of others to the place that they might the others might cooperate more with the spirit than they might have otherwise and that includes like faith healers but especially like mm-hmm. trained physicians like i think a lot of healing that occurs in hospitals <laughs> are because the the physicians had the right drug or the right technique it's that people went to the hospitals believing the physicians had, with their best chance of getting well 
and that raised their cooperation with the spirit working through the physicians. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I guess what I said earlier will will probably strike some people as really weird that I'm open to demons, but I doubt there's a devil. That's kind of a, Mm -hmm. I've never heard anybody else say that. So I could expand on that if you want me to. Yeah. You still believe in like casting out demons? Like I've seen a few where like in a Pentecostal church, someone was like, you know, at least supposedly possessed by demons. And we saw people pray and cast the demon out. And it was like a whole almost theatrical thing. It felt like, um, oh, yeah. not saying that it wasn't real, but it, it, it felt like a, like a production almost. I participated in those both as a leader and as an observer and some were successful and some were not. So I've thought a lot about what I think's going on there. First off, I prefer to say people might be oppressed by demons rather than possessed because I believe that people retain mm-hmm. agency. And so it's not like mm-hmm. uh, you watch some movies and it sounds like the demon takes over someone's life. I, I don't believe in that. Um, however, if there are demonic figures and these demons have some kind of ontological status, something like what we think of as a localized angelic body or whatever, more like a mind probably, then I suspect that they influence people's minds and people then cooperate to varying levels with them. And what we see in these um, um, exorcisms is a convincing of the person not to cooperate with those demonic forces. And because there's a strong mind-body connection, the body's you know, quirky moves and all that sort of stuff can be accounted for in that mind body, the psychosomatic union there. That's mm-hmm. how I think about that. Sort you know, of I like stuff. that explanation. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. I, um, which, which, Hey, I'm curious kind of on, on y'all's take on this, but like, I feel as though the church I grew up in over spiritualized things in general, but at the same time, given a lot of the things that I experienced or that I saw, it seems to me, and again, I'm not trying to belittle other people's opinion. You know, the whole point of the series is to see both sides. And we're going to go back to kind of looking at the other side of this, the cessationism and what that argument is. But just getting personal for a second. I mean, for me, it would feel almost crazy to see the things that I've seen and be like, oh, yeah, none of that was real because I, I saw it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I I think it's it's real what you see. The big question, though, is what are the metaphysical explanations for it? And that's where I think the Pentecostal church in general has failed. I I know some exceptions because I have some Pentecostal theologian friends. But um, in general, the Pentecostals I know have made it about a warfare and have had people pawns in this warfare between the devil and his demons and God and these angels. And there's like these two metaphysical forces at play. You know, um, I first sort of got hooked into this by reading this present darkness. I don't know if you guys know this book, but it was like, I heard of it. I haven't read it. Yeah. Uh, Anyway. And, and I just don't think that's the reality of things. I think we have real free will. I think there are natural, there's something like natural laws and regularities in the world there because I'm a panpsychist and think that it's not just human minds, but other creatures have agency, our cells have agency. I think we have to account for all that sort of stuff. So um, I don't think you should doubt the experiences you've had, but I think you ought to think carefully about what explanations make the most sense of those experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that a lot of Pentecostals would benefit from just a, a little, a little bit more liturgy mm. uh, for reasons like this, where yeah. they're not, you know, confident on what it's coming from. It's just, yep, demon in the girls' cabin. Got to take care of that. Yeah, uh, no one go over there for a minute. Yeah. So, just just because I feel like we, we're tiptoeing around it, and I now just kind of want to like lean into this. I, I, I'm kind of mentioned like with my own self. Um, experience plays a large part of this for me of like what I do or don't believe how much does your personal experience or what you both have seen ex- like impact your beliefs when it comes to the continuation of the gifts of spirit. I've been talking like TJ, why don't you st- start this one? So for me, it really, I have always been a fan of learning from 
other people's experiences. Uh, the best way to learn from a mistake is for it to be someone else's. It's <laughs> kind yeah. of how I see things. Uh, so I'm fully ready to believe someone that I trust if they say they have experienced a gift that I haven't. Yeah, I'm probably not as trusting in other people's experiences as you are, TJ. Not that I, you know, doubt everything, but um, I well, actually, let me. Let me say it differently. I would say this. I have grown to be skeptical of the explanations people give of their experience. I don't doubt the experience, but I doubt how the framework that they will use to explain that experience. Um, I think there's also some things to take into account if you are going to not be a cessationist. And one of them is that it seems from all the reports I have heard and from people or sort of data points that there's a far more quote gift language, like demonic uh, activity in third world countries or less developed countries, whatever language you think works best there. Uh, If you have a really high view of science and physicians you tend not to see as many demons as a- and angels. Now, people yeah. who are fans of the demons and angels, they'll say, well, that's just modernity is, you know, uh, the devil is using the modern age to trick you. And the best thing that the devil wants is to not believe you're real and all that kind of crap. Mm-hmm. But um, I think it says something about the explanations people want to give about to about the world. And if the explanations you have point to natural laws, point to reason, point to science, point to physicians, medical training, drugs, all that sort of stuff, then you're just naturally going to appeal to those when you see something weird happening as either to try to fix it or as the cause. Whereas if you don't have that background, you're much more likely to blame it on gods and devils. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's I actually struggled a lot with that growing up because I've always been kind of like biology focused, I would Mm -hmm. say. Uh, Growing up, my mom was in college. I was doing her biology courses. Then my sister was in college. I was doing her biology courses. Then I took my own. So I've always been very aware medically for like reasons Mm -hmm. that things happen. But I've never been against someone saying it's a different reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I. For me, science is, I'm perfectly fine with using science as just the way to describe God's work. Yeah. Like yeah. fractalization, you, things like that. Are you guys familiar with the line, God of the gaps? Has you come across that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's yeah. something that's often used in the science and religion dialogue. And the, the notion will be, um, look, we have a particular explanation for you know, why the world exists or why this happened and it's God. And then uh, science will come along and give another explanation that seems more plausible. And so God will be taken out of that and put in another place where we don't have a good answer. And God kind of moves around in the gaps that science hasn't figured out. And of course, the problem with that is that if you begin to think that science has good answers for these gaps that don't involve God, pretty soon God is shoved out entirely. Yeah, I well, I don't have hear people t- talking about this, but I also believe in a de- that there we have a problem of the demon of the gaps, and that is especially in Pentecostal circles when something weird goes on, the devil gets blamed rather than mental illness or psychosis or something like that, and one of the I think major criticisms of attributing uh, weird behavior to the demonic is how often people who have those behaviors, when they start taking drugs and medicine, those behaviors go away. You have to say that the demons are being controlled by the pills. And I think that's a weird way for most people to think. Mm -hmm. So just like I'm skeptical of the God of the gap problems, I'm also skeptical of the demon of the gaps. Yeah. Yeah. Without getting into how alchemy is medicine, then yeah, it's just odd to think about. Yeah. yeah, I I think that's where 
e- even though, and, I, and we've talked plenty of times on this show that people know I don't fully agree with Dr. Ord, but th- that's where a lot of your explanations really, I think, are helpful and where I really appreciate them, where we're kind of marrying the two, right? We're not saying right. there's a separate spiritual problem and then there's physical problems. There's one of the two. Like, it, Actually, it could be both, right? Like, it could be this mental issue and still have a deeper spiritual meaning that's cooperating with it, whether cooperating for good or evil, and we're able to kind of see that. Um, I, I like those kind of explanations. They, they make a lot more sense to me than God created a physical world but can't interact with it. Like, I, what? Huh? That doesn't make yeah. sense, right? Like, yeah. Well, and here, this wild idea that will probably – some of your listeners will think, well, this is really getting nuts, but I'm going to put it on the table anyway. In philosophy, there's a view called panpsychism. And it says that it's not just humans who have minds or mentality, but everything that exists has some kind of mental agency. So worms make decisions. Mm -hmm. Cells have responsiveness. Mm -hmm. And if you start going down that path, and which I'm very welcomed, I encourage people to go down that path, then Mm -hmm. you've got a kind of a world that's not purely material. You've got kind of like a spiritualized or the word that's oftentimes used is an enchanted world, a world that is comprised of agents minute to macro. And if you have that kind of world, it's a whole lot easier than to think about God, the spirit being active in the world and the weird stuff you're seeing arising from this diverse agents at various levels, rather than having to attribute some outside demonic or devil as the, you know, person who's making these weird things occur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So not to, not to divert the conversation any, um, but I I mentioned, you know, some of my experiences, like what, what I know about my grandfather. Um, I think people out here probably have heard me talk about my accident and my survival as though it was a miracle. And, you know, that's not to belittle what work and surgeons and all that happened. Actually, I probably would agree with you that, it was through the work of the surgeons as well as prayer and all these other things working together that I was able to survive what a lot of people, including the other guy's lawyer, said I shouldn't have been able to survive, right? Um, and, you know, I, have to, I think miracles happen. I think I've seen plenty of miracles. I would even say I've seen people who were, um, maybe I won't say a, a possessed anymore. Maybe I'll say oppressed by demons. <laughs> I, yeah. do, I do like that that verbiage. Um, I, I've even, I believe I've seen angels. Or, you know, I hallucinated one of the two. So, um, yeah, I had a lot of really spiritual experiences myself. And again, you know, I said I'm just going to out myself as a crazy Pentecostal this episode. Um, What are the kind of things that you guys have seen that maybe are contributing to your beliefs on this? Uh, Because I I don't think it's possible to completely disconnect yourself from your own experience, right? Yeah. I mean, I've been kind of surrounded by it my whole life most of the gifts not prophecy i've never seen someone prophesy at least not one that's come to pass it would be pretty cool that's the one i'm still rooting for that i haven't seen but have you seen like healing that kind of stuff not the kind of like broken leg walk up on the spot and it's fixed yeah yeah Yeah. that one healing is one i feel weird about because healing i feel like is a lot rarer because in the you know 2000 years ago the spiritual gift of healing might have been the only way a lot of things were getting healed mm-hmm. so it stands to reason that it would be more common yeah and healing they all bring up different concerns and stuff right like healing for me one of the big concerns i've seen is um a lot of people even really close to me have actually even preached the whole you don't really believe in god if every time you have a headache your first step is advil instead of prayer and I'm like what why can't i take Advil as I pray, <laughs> right? Like, why is it going to be separate? Um, but yeah, th- there is some danger in not in believing in the healing, but I-, I think rather in saying this is the only way and, you know, neglecting what gifts God has given us in modern technology, right? <laughs> or medicine. Yeah. Um, Dr. Ord, what are, what are some of the things that you've seen that maybe are contributing to your thought? Well, I'm like, here? I'm like TJ. I've never seen anything so spectacular that I couldn't point to some naturalistic um, explanation. At least part of that explanation is naturalistic. Since I obviously, well, not obviously, but from our past conversations, I've oftentimes said, 
that I think everything that occurs has both a natural and a divine activity in it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Every healing then has both natural and divine activity involved. But like TJ, I've never seen a full leg grow. And I'm very skeptical of people who say they have, because as we all know, sometimes people do hoaxes, you know, they do tricks. And once you find out that tricks sometimes occur, then you're going to be jaded when someone has something that comes along. I'm also very skeptical of healings uh, that are these dramatic things like TJ talked about because of my experience of people who claim to have those and then me seeing the evidence of those claims. And oftentimes what it is is a person says, oh, God completely healed my leg. And then I look at the leg and I see things that aren't healed or the person says, God completely healed it. And then they still go to the doctor the next week because they've still got problems. And so I think, okay, well, what they're saying is completely healed isn't anything like what I think of as completely healed. (laughs) Um, And I also, yeah. I I think it's ironic that you use leg as an example. Uh, I, I hope I've never said the word completely. But I, I know after my accident, I was told I'm probably never going to hike or run again. I can do both of those things. I would not say that I can do them as well as I had before the accident by any means. But I, I remember actually when I first read Francis Chan's books, which again, I'm sorry I brought this up so many times because I know not all of us agree fully with Francis Chan and his theology. <laughs> but um, I remember reading at the top, or actually I hiked Crowder's Mountain and I was like, aha, I can hike. I might never be able to run again, but at least I can do this, right? And like that was like my mindset. And I had started reading this book and he kind of brings attention to like how we say we believe in a God of everything and we believe in this whole divine spiritual world and how crazy it is that we still put some limits on it um, of like, God can never fully heal me. God never do this. I actually do agree with Dr. Ward. Like I I feel like there is part divine and natural to everything. Um, So again, the fully question is a thing, but I I did then after reading it, try to run because I hadn't even tried at that point And, and I was able to run. But if you watch me run, you're still going to be able to look at them and be like, he's kind of limping, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Like, and that, that, that's a thing. Um, is it a miracle that I'm able to run at all? Absolutely, in my opinion, yeah. Um, he is also, it to say that it has completely gone away? Nope. Yeah, he also didn't look that normal when he ran before the accident. To be completely <laughs> fair. That is also fair. <laughs> he, he ran kind of weird. Your language here brings up something that I, I often like to to address, uh, point out. Since you both were part of Pentecostal churches, I'm guessing you heard something like I've heard, which is something like this. Look, the doctors don't really know what's going on. We have the great physician in Jesus and Jesus knows. Mm-hmm. You know. yep. Yep. So kind of like you can't trust the doctors is basically what it's saying. And yet those very same people do what you did, Josh, and say, well, the doctor said, I'll never walk again. So all of a sudden, the doctor's the authority when it comes to what the future is going to be and the limits of what I can do. And then God exceeded those things. So I, I have to say to those people, look, if you don't trust the doctors of knowing what healing is going on, then don't trust their predictions about whether or not you're ever going <laughs> to walk again. Yeah. Um, be, be rational about this because um, doctors don't know what the future is going to be, just like God doesn't know the future. And so I think we need to be careful about, well, it's a miracle because the doctor said I'd never do X again. Well, the doctor's, a, you know, not omniscient, even in the the limited sense. So we need to be careful about that. Yeah. yeah. I like think... People exaggerate what the doctor says. The doctor sure. usually says, you probably will never walk again. They go, he says, I'll never do it again. Okay, hold up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like to think most doctors try to undersell the problem or oversell yeah. the problem. Like, yeah, yeah, you might never walk again when realistically you probably will. Yeah. Like, if there's a 50 50 chance, you should say probably not. <laughs> Yeah. Just <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was lucky. Uh, I also horrendously broke my leg, but I walked again in like three days because uh. metal rods are cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't love my metal rod whenever it's cold outside, but they have their drawbacks. Sure, I'm glad I can walk. <laughs> yeah. Um. So whenever, like, so so we we brought up a lot of the issues, and I wonder 
do these issues make it hard for you, Dr. Ord, to still kind of say you believe in a continuation of the spirit whenever we do know people say, oh, I'm prophesying you should vote for Donald Trump again, right? Like, so I know this thing yeah. is a prophecy or you shouldn't go to the doctor because I, you know, healing, you know, we have all these issues we're bringing up about people who maybe are continuationist. Do those issues, like practical issues, make it harder for you to hold on to the idea at all that they're spiritual gifts? Not really, because I think uh, that God exists. I don't know it, but I think that there's good reason to think that. And that God is a spirit active in all the world. I don't know that either, but I think I have good reasons. So when people you know, say things like, well, God told me to marry you, or God told me that Donald Trump is who ought to be president, or, you know, God healed this, that, and the other. And if I think they're idiots, then I just blame the idiots. I don't blame the spirit. So I've, I got no problem thinking people misunderstand the spirit, misconstrue the spirit, claim that God is doing things that God isn't. Um, I put the blame on the people, not on God. So my, my faith that that there is a Holy Spirit active in the world is, I mean, for someone who doesn't know things for sure, it's, I'm, I've, I feel pretty confident in that. Yeah. So what would you say are the greatest strengths and weaknesses, both in the argument that the continuation of the spirits does exist and in the argument that they don't, the cessationist, I guess would be that one. Yeah. You talking, asking me or TJ? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Ward, if you had a um, point well, strengths think, and weaknesses of each argument. Yeah, the argument for for why against saying that the spirits continue is one that I mentioned earlier. In some contexts, people don't see that kind of evidence. Um, another argument against that is that in those contexts and people with, in which people do see evidence, what they're seeing as evidence really doesn't consist as evidence. So that's... That's the problem with saying it continues on like it, like, you know, recording in scripture. The evidence or the arguments against the cessationist view is that, um, look, sometimes good things happen that are unexpected, unusual, that people want to call miraculous. They may be rare, (laughs) but they do seem to happen. And it may be just simply because we don't understand. It might be a matter of our having lack of knowledge, you know, obviously we don't know all things, but you still have to account for those things in some way. And so the cessationist doesn't have a good, at least theological account for those, um, like the, the other side does. Yeah. Um, briefly, I just want to touch on the, the, the biblical arguments, uh, usually actually first Corinthians 13, it says something about the gifts ceasing, but love never ceasing. Mm. Um, and a lot of cessationists will point to see it's a cease and it clearly means whenever the apostles leave. Um, I just think it's crazy because if, if you take that interpretation of first Corinthians 13, what you're saying is that the author was saying, love is awesome. It's going to last longer than the apostles. I, I just don't think that's what the author intended by that no. statement. I think he meant that love's going to last forever and the gifts won't last forever. I don't think he's talking about a specific time when the apostles pass away. Cause, uh, that makes that statement about love seem not that powerful. <laughs> so it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, I don't know about that. I don't think any of the biblical writers had our time in mind when they were writing. In fact, Jesus, Jesus, the guy that I think is most impressed with, he was wrong in thinking that the earth was going to end pretty soon. So they had an eschatological vision that thought the time was short, which is why the apostle Paul said, don't marry if you're, you know, unless you're lusting, don't marry. Everybody thought the end of the world was coming quick. They weren't writing for people in the 21st century. Well. To Again, be fair, of course, it depends what you mean by quick. Yeah, if you, if your life well, they said world, eternal, their lifetime. <laughs> What's that, TJ? I was like, well, if your life is technically eternal. Yeah, I get some weird Christ. Jesus is God. Arguments. Uh, yeah, I yeah, don't want to touch that anymore. Yeah, I think that's a different. I think episode. most biblical scholars would say Jesus thought that. Um, the end of the age was coming, you know, uh, what is the apostle Paul within this generation? Maybe Jesus even says that. Um, so yeah, they thought even if, sure even if I'm that. wrong, that they didn't think it was going to happen within their lifetimes or within a hundred years, I would still be very confident in saying they didn't have TJ, Tom and Josh in mind when they were writing on this gifts of the spirit. Yeah. 
Also, yeah. for the record, uh, what the Bible says Jesus did that maybe your Bible has in red letters, uh, that's still just the disciple as best as he can remember what Jesus said. Yeah. So there's, well, there's layers here. Of, yeah. Not only that, it's them writing 40 to 50 to 60 years after the incident. So, yeah, yeah. we won't get into biblical problems because there's tons of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a different yeah. episode. The apostles <laughs> yeah. should have had mandatory body know. cam. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but I, I really, I wish we had a cessationist on this episode. I want to know. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I don't know. Do you think we've, we've Just not treated them process. fairly? I don't know any is all I'm saying. Yeah. I don't really know any either. I feel like I probably do like probably Brandon or Joe or one of them is a cessationist. We just haven't asked them. I doubt it. Maybe. Maybe maybe Will's a cessationist. Let's ask him. But really, really, I, I, say... I wanted to ask a cessationist if they believe that the gifts of the Spirit can return. Well, they would probably say yes, just because most of them have um, are believe in an omnipotent God. So they would say, in right. theory, yeah. But, you know, you know, like I'm saying, like, I think most people who are cessationist would say the gifts ceased because we didn't need them anymore. That That is something I've heard before. Uh, I'll so say this. So if would they come back? Well, maybe so. Hmm. Um, although I can't think of anybody I know personally who's a cessationist in terms of, you know, what they claim. Hmm. I think the majority of American Christians I know are sensationists functionally. In mm, other yeah. words, they live as if they're not expecting speaking mm -hmm. in tongues, healings, words of knowledge, whatever. Yeah. But uh, so we are asking every guest to try their best to make the best argument they can against their own position. Uh, it seems like something you're pretty good at generally. Uh, if you had to make an argument against your own stance on, you know, continuation, how would it go? Probably the best, the argument that I find best against my view would be something along the lines of a scientific one, that everything that people attribute to the work of God, demons, whatever, Holy Spirit, has some kind of naturalist explanation that doesn't require um, God, demons, angels, whatever. Yeah. See, my issue with those arguments is that it doesn't matter if it doesn't require divine intervention. The divine intervention is there. Well, what do you mean? If a person's a hard going naturalist, they don't think there is a divine to intervene. So, right. But understand. I don't agree with them. Oh, oh, so you're just assuming God exists to begin with. Well, obviously, I think there's good reason to think God exists too, but I was trying to give what I thought was the best argument against my view. Yeah. 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 Fair agree. enough. Well, so if the works of the Spirit are meant to be the functions of the members of the church, is it possible to have unity while disagreeing over this topic? Let's hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a hard question because as I've said in other episodes, I'm not real clear about what unity is. Um, it sounds nice and fluffy, but I don't see it and I can't imagine it even um, because at least the way unity is usually understood, it's either unity in belief, which I doubt very much will ever be the case unless we all become omniscient. Or it's unity and love, but love requires an epistemic element as well. And I highly doubt we're all going to agree on what's the most loving thing in any particular moment. Um, so I have a hard time answering these unity questions because it's not clear to me what unity looks like or could look like. Yeah, I think, I think we've defined on here before. Like the the ideas where people are like unity of mind, that's really just uniformity. That's not actually unity. Um, unity, I think, by definition, has more to do with like action and whether we're able to come together to do the works. But then I think that again, that's still going to go to the mind of what do we define as the works? Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's where a lot of the the bigger problems come from. Um, and, and you know, I'm not sure. You know, I, I think. 
if, you know, I'm defining the works within my community, let's say just feeding the hungry, homing the homeless, you know, homing the homeless. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, Housing the homeless. Building homes for the homeless. Yeah, there we go. Um, you know, I, obviously, I'm not going to have a problem. If someone says, hey, I think speaking in tongues is dumb. And I speak in tongues. If he's still willing to help me help them, whatever, you know, I don't see why that would be an issue. Um, but if, you know, he's thinking, I don't know, I, I can't think of a scenario where this should be relevant to the works. But I think a lot of people are just so, I, I think the problem usually comes in from the other side, where a lot of people are so convinced that this thing is equal, whether that be, you know, homosexuality, whether that be, um, you know, in this case, speaking in tongues, if you're so convinced that that is evil and you think being seen working alongside someone who's doing that will convince other people that they should be okay with it, I could see that being a problem. But from the side where you think it's fine, you think it's of the spirit, then it's like, well, why do I care if someone doesn't think it? I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think a big problem is that it's much easier to see unity outside of the church when the goal isn't spreading God it's a lot easier to see unity uh, and like for spreading knowledge. Uh, we've been to theology beer camp. We all unify to spread knowledge and beer for a couple of days. <laughs> yeah. But we yeah. don't represent the majority of the church. <laughs> That's true. No. That's true. Well, so uh, yeah, there could probably be pockets of unity. Yeah. It's much easier to see in a microcosm. Yeah. 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 Well, so, so I'll provide one, one thing, that, and it's why I really like the other show we do, Systematic Ecology, because I think as much as we, we talk about unity here, I think a lot of times it's shown better there, <laughs> if that makes sense. Mm. Um, so recently, um, today of the recording, we released the episode, it's Kingdom Hearts and the Heroine of Hell. So you have me, James, Christian, and Barbara getting together, talking about a video game, and then hero, Jesus going to hell and back. Um me and Christian have wildly different thoughts about that. Of course, naturally, that almost always happens with me and Christian. But we still see the conversation as important enough that we're going to work together to discuss this and open the question up for others. And I think working together to provide that framework and that question for others is a form of unity, even though we were disagreeing about what we both thought about it. We still thought the mission to have the question out there was worthwhile. So I, I think that's a degree of unity. I, just for me, it's easier to point to examples than to explain. I don't know. Yeah, I think we can find unity again in, in small situations. Yeah. Uh, I just, usually when people talk about unity in the church, they have in mind this notion that all the denominations are going to go away and somehow we're all going to be of one mind on everything. And I'm just highly skeptical that will ever even in the afterlife, which I believe in an afterlife, I'm highly skeptical that we'll have that kind of unity. Yeah, I think that version might just not happen. But I, I think we can learn to work together better in some circumstances. I, I think it's one of those things that, luckily, I don't think it's a goal that will ever just be accomplished. I think it's more of a direction to lean towards. Um, and I say luckily because if it was accomplishable, then at some point this podcast would just end because we did it. The end. Yeah. But one because of, it's directional, we could just keep going in that direction. Yeah. One of, one of the biggest issues with unity is that it unity is easier to achieve when it is goal-oriented. Mm. And when your goal is extremely yeah. broad, it's not easy to unify under. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That is true. When and, the goal is unity, that's pretty <laughs> difficult. Yeah. Yeah, because it's... Just working together to say that we should work together. Well, what do you mean by that? What are the <laughs> what are the parameters? You know, I, I don't think the, a lot of our Southern Baptist friends are going to agree with how the three of us might want to address, pastor, and care for the LGBTQ plus community. And I don't think, you know, a lot of the um, I'm trying to think may, maybe not a lot of the uh, Methodist might not agree with how TJ and I think you know, that there is an important element of the spiritual gifts and we should pray for healing as we go to the doctor, you know, yeah, I think some of the specifics make it challenging and it's just kind of feeling out where it's possible and uh, leaning to those plate areas where we can do it and maybe not leaning into the areas where it's impossible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
So, with that <laughs> convoluted answer, Dr. Ord, you know, we usually ask everybody if they could provide a, um, a, a tangible action that would help engender unity, what it would be. And for this, we're specifically trying to address, like, the topics of the episode. So, for those who are on, find themselves on different sides on whether the spiritual gifts continue or not, what do you think would be your best piece of advice for how they can kind of uh, offer up an olive branch, reach out to another, work together? They disagree about uh, spiritual gifts. So here's a practical thing. Someone who has a different view on, let's say, speaking in tongues, since we've talked about that one, uh, listen to the other side carefully and then see what you can do to incorporate their experience in the explanatory framework you find most plausible. That's my, that, that's my attempt at having a, uh, yeah. Some kind of unity over <laughs> contentious uh, situations. Listen to the other, affirm their experience, and then try to make sense of it from your own framework. Could you maybe walk us through like an example of like what do you think that would sound like in practice? Yeah. So Mary comes to me and says, you know, uh, um, I was praying, I was uh, at church, and all of a sudden God took over. It was a God moment, and God intervened. And suddenly, against my will, I started speaking Chinese. And it was me speaking in tongues. And Brother Jimmy stood up and translated to the congregation uh, what I was saying in Chinese. Now, I'm going to hear that, and I'm going to say to myself, okay, this woman stood up. Apparently, this happened. Whether or not she spoke Chinese, I'm probably skeptical unless she knows Chinese. But maybe that happened. Um, what do I think is going on there? Well, I'm going to probably interpret it as her agency, other people's agencies in response to what they felt like the Holy Spirit was doing at the time. And I'm going to run it through that framework in my brain. Um, and then I'm going to look at her and I say, man, if that was a beautiful experience, great. That's probably how I'm going to go about it. Hmm. Someone else, though, one of my friends who's a thoroughgoing naturalist, they're going to say, God had nothing to do with that. I'm going to explain that by some sort of mental lapse or uh, pressure from the community to conform or, uh, you know, they're going to have some other kind of explanation. Yeah. Psychiatric break. Yeah, mm-hmm. psychiatric break. That's a good. I hear that one a lot. Yeah. Mass mm-hmm. hysteria. Yep. So if everyone does that where they adapt experience into their framework uh what 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 would be the repercussions in the world what happens well it's not going to bring everybody to agreement on explanatory frameworks because what i'm suggesting everyone kind of keeps theirs but what hopefully it does is it challenges people to see um to understand their framework better and maybe see where their framework might have some holes in it um I know that I've changed my mind over time. My explanatory framework has changed. And so I'm hopeful that in some situations, a person's uh, framework will change. But at least listening to the experience opens one up to being, um, to trying to assess whether the explanations they find helpful really are as helpful as, as they think. All right. So, before we wrap up, we'd like to ask everyone to share a moment where they saw God recently. We are doing our God moment. You've done this before. If this is your first episode, great choice also. Uh, this is how we end every show. Uh, just ask where they saw God recently, whether that be a blessing, challenge, moment of worship, whatever it may be. And I always make Josh go first. So myself and our guests have as much time to think about this as we need. Uh, so Josh, do you have a God moment for us? Yeah, it's not fair that Easter just happened. It makes us too easy it, feels it, is, like. it is a bit easier yeah. than than other weeks yeah um i actually got to go to my own church for easter i usually go to my parents um and it, it's interesting you know different frameworks talk about the resurrection of the cross all this stuff differently right um one of the hymns sung was thinking kind of about how because jesus resurrected i am able to resurrect and for some reason it hadn't clicked in my mind before that like I could, I could almost very literally relate to that where it's like, I, I sort of was 
experience, like that whole thing of death and I'm here. And, and, you know, usually I'm just like, oh, the miracle, oh, God wanted me for something else. And I, and I don't think I very often meditate on just the very personal experience of, no, I, I was facing death uh, that no longer was. Because, because I, to an extreme, I think, I, I think of others and I think of ministry and I don't often think of myself. So it was interesting to just kind of put that in the framework of, no, no, I personally had an experience that was just meaningful for me. And I'm able to just let that be my experience without it having to have some kind of implication for the other or anybody else, you know? Um, I think I was able to have just kind of regain that experience and able to internalize it as something more personal and intimate than uh, I think I framed it before to others. So it was kind of nice. Can I go next? Because I actually have to get going here. And so can I yes. uh, go next oh, and share my moment and then, and then, have to, and then go? Uh, for me, it was Easter Sunday as well, Josh. Um, I was with yeah. my granddaughter, who's uh, five years old. And we started singing. And I picked her up and held her as I sang the songs. She likes to put her head against my chest and hear my body verberate when I sing. She, she doesn't sing much, but she just likes to lay there. And, um, that was a God moment. I mean, I think God's present in all moments, but some are, uh, I call those God moments in which I feel like there's a special sense of God's presence. Maybe God's yeah. highlight reel. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Hey, thanks again for letting me chat with you guys. I got to run, but uh, yeah, thanks for I really joining enjoyed us, it. Really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah I need you. a, I need to talk to you on a, a trip about y'all's newest book soon. Okay. Yeah. yeah let's do one. that. All right. All right. Yep. All talk right. to you later. Uh, you can just close the tab. All right. Okay. Work. So what's your gun? Uh, so uh, my pastor did a kind of a little thing. This is mine's not from Easter. Uh huh. It could be though. Uh, okay, we'll pretend. Yeah, but it's not. Uh, so he got myself and some of the other young adults from our church together and took us out to dinner and apologized for what he felt like was the ministry's failings of not being able to provide a proper young adult ministry for us at our home church. And it was crazy. Just insane to see. I uh, like almost like on the verge of tears, like promising he was trying to fix the problem and addressing the issues and asking us to help him help us. It was it was wild. Wow. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So if you listen this far, please consider uh, sharing this episode with a friend, an enemy, or your cousin. Multiple would be ideal. Cousins. Yeah, get in the cousins group. Chat. All your cousins and all of TJ's cousins. That's pretty much the whole CSI guideline. Yeah. So, uh, check out our shop. Check out the merch store. Uh, Josh is wearing some right now. If you're just listening, you're missing out. It is a pretty comfy shirt. Uh, God, it, it looks it's great. It looks wearable which I feel like is hard for a lot of podcast merch to do. You, you can wear it without feeling yeah. like a nerd about it. That's true. Yeah. It is very Christian though. You can't wear it without someone just, ah, that's a Christian. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, come on, it's a whole church podcast and not much merch we can make. That's not going to be blatantly Christian. Yeah. If, if some, if you're going to wear it, someone's going to ask you about it, then you're going to have to tell them about it. So that There's one's kind that. of unavoidable anyway. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of the point. Anyway, so if you want to hear other shows like ours, check out all the other shows on the Amazon Podcast Network with the link below. You can hear uh, Pastor Will in the homily. You can hear Christian in Let Nothing Move You. I was actually guessing an episode on that recently. Wow. So check out. You know Christian yeah. Ashley. Yeah. Wow. Wild. It's one of my favorite authors. Crazy. Have you actually read any of his books? No. Hopefully he doesn't listen this far. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> I need to. I like. It's just. It's been sitting there. I'm just gonna wait. Yeah, for I also need to read. I'm it. just. I'm just lazy. He is a good author, though. I know he knows how to write. I've read some That's other true. stuff he's written. So yeah. we hope you enjoyed it. Next week we are going to have an episode concluding this series as Joshua and I discuss what we've learned in the last eight weeks. That is a semester. We've been doing this for a semester. Uh, yeah. We're gonna be taking true. a week off. 
And finally, at the end of season one, Francis Chan will be joining us. He doesn't know that, though. So. Completely Someone unaware. let him know. Completely yeah. and blissfully oblivious. I've really played this stuff too much for him not to guess, though. I feel like now yeah. he's obligated. Six times in this episode. <laughs>